Once was a swagman camped by a billabong under the shade of a coolabar tree. As he sat, as he watched and waited while his billy boiled, he'll come a waltzing Matilda with me. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Arnie Lukes at the Crossroads. Uh, we've had a, a bit of a break, a bit of a sabbatical while we all took a breath. And uh, I'd like to introduce our panel members for today. Betty Lukes from Adelaide. Welcome, Betty. Good morning, Arnie. And Wallace Clink from Canada. Welcome, Wallace. Good evening, Arnie. It's <laughs> a little bit rain. It's it's a bit rainy here. It's a blustery and they're getting wetter all the time. So as, it's good as, to be in talking with you. As long as it's not minus twenty nine, Wally. That's the only thing that can. <laughs> okay, right. The subject for today: the canon of rightness. The canon of rightness. Righteousness. Rightness. Meaning the same thing. And the canon in that um, we need to actually look at law and we need to understand what is natural law, what is canon law, what is moral code, what is moral law. And uh, we're going to hopefully disassemble each one of those so that you've got a clear understanding of, uh, of each one of those terms. Um, and that's our objective. So uh, I'll open the floor. Betty Luke. <clears throat> Thank you, Arnie. Well, what it is, uh, Wally has a habit of referring to natural law and it, it got me thinking as to, now what does he mean by natural law? And I felt that it needed to be unpacked. And of course, um, there is all the difference in the world between a fact, an opinion, and uh, what is really the code of morals that we call the Ten Commandments. And uh, I discovered there is a clear difference between fact and opinion. And uh, the, the creeds of Christendom are statements of fact about the nature of God and the universe. You may not agree with them, but these are the statements of fact that in the early centuries of Christendom, they were hammered out, and uh, it spoke, of course, it speaks, of course, about the Trinitarian structure and of, of the universe, and it corresponds by a necessary uniformity of substance with the nature of all that is, all that exists, of God. And um, <clears throat> then I thought about the the Ten Commandments and realized that that really is a moral code. And uh, I think you'll find that it's not just in the Old Testament, but there are other nations before that had similar codes. Hold it there, uh, Betty. Thanks for that. Now, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you've mentioned the word moral code. You've used the words moral code. And Wally, you made mention or reference to Wally having said natural law. And there is obviously a difference, a variance. And I, I put another word out there and I say canon law, canon law. And these are all variances and they're all quite important. And it's important for us to start actually um, discerning the difference. So I'm going to give the floor to Wally and let Wally explain natural law as he understands it. Wally. Well, <clears throat> we have natural law, we have canon law, and we have civil law. Uh, those are three rather, you know, clearly defined uh, ways of looking at law. Natural law, I assume, is what is simply built into the universe. It's something that exists, it's there that we can't change, and we can only prosper or benefit by conforming to it. Uh, in the most appropriate manner. Uh, if you, we know what physical law is, at least we have a very good idea, we can discover laws or principles and we can, we can uh, <clears throat> use them to actually accomplish certain specific tasks and so on. And we know that if we do not follow the laws that we have discovered, and we violate them that we get consequences and those consequences are usually not the consequences that we desire they're usually unpleasant so <clears throat> on the other hand we've spoken about the moral law 
And that relates to canon law, of course, because canon law is the ecclesiastical law, I guess you would say. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the moral law goes beyond the physical. It, it, it uh, involves our relationships with each other, how we treat each other, how we think about each other, how we think about ourselves within the universe. And so that this is um, something to do with association. And it's, but it is subject to principles too, just like the physical, uh, the physical materials and, and energy in, in the universe. The way we associate and the attitudes that we, uh, uh, with which we uh, do that definitely have very, very definite, they definitely have very specific and definite effects. And those effects can be good or bad in terms of our happiness or satisfaction. Excellent. Thank you for that, uh, Wally. That's, that's, very, that's very profound that there's a, a canon in the universe. And that canon is something that we've actually got to look for and attempt to obey. And if we do, then we derive benefit from it. And as a people, as a people, that canon. And, uh, and I think that's fascinating because you've got your, if you like, the difference between natural law and the moral code. And I'm going to pass it back to, um, to Betty to uh, continue to unpack. Betty. <clears throat> well, I, I want to refer to the um, saying in the New Testament, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And Magna, uh, Magna Carta is really a signpost of where this was recognized, that it was important that the things of God, the spiritual things, that the, the church shall be free and, uh, and have its li liberties inviolable. And why I'm reminded of this is because just recently I um, had a book, a book was purchased here in Australia and it was dealing with common law and uh, I've only flicked through it but what astounded me was that the author of this book uh, who was going back to common law and showing some of the history of it and, and noted about it, the, the, he's got those records correct, but his observation was that, that um, he passed over the fact that Henry VIII um, took over the role of the church and, and brought it under the power of Caesar, under the power of government. And, uh, and he didn't see anything wrong with that. Well, I would say that we have seen the results of that when we look at the state of the church today because the Christian leaders have not recognized that there is this canon of rightness that they have ignored and to such an extent that the church is in a very serious position today. Thank one you, Catholic Church, if I just finish on this line, one Catholic Church, church made the observation that we're back, we're back the, the, the church itself is back in the early Christian centuries. That's how much influence and, and authority it has out there in the community. Thank you for that, Betty. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to get, cut across to an image here. And to me, the image depicts uh, what we're attempting to uncover. The image there is a triketra. It's a symbol. And if you like the, um, the symbol that's there, you have the three facets to it, but you've also got the circle. And uh, the circle essentially is an area of commonality, an area where each will have some influence over the other. Now, I put it to you that the Trinity that this we're depicting, we're discussing today, is the people, the church and the state, the people, the church and the state, and that each is necessary. The Sabbath was made for man, the man for the Sabbath, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, 
legitimizing government, all right? Legitimizing government, but don't have so much government. There, there is no room for God. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. There's a balance in that. And what we're seeing is an imbalance. Firstly, that the state, in the case of the Church of England, the state has taken over that church. And I might add that it's, it's probably taken over other churches in other nations, but we'll just concentrate on this one because Henry's obvious and we've inherited this, um, this, this issue of where the state has actually taken over the church. And, and so there's an imbalance and there's no ethical or canon of rightness being presented to pull the state back into line. Wally Clay. Well, there's been an insidious and gradual trend for um, power to move toward the center, another centralization of power in the hands of the state because people have largely because of the financial system we live under, which makes it more and more difficult financially to live, even though we've become far more capable physically of living. Um, there has been a tendency for, of course, the individual to seek relief and they go to the state in order to get it. And the state obliges by taxing the rest of us and um, increasing its own power, of course, through its administrative breadth that it uh, secures due to all of these uh, additional uh, tasks that it, that it, uh, that it uh, assumes. It seems to me that in the very, very early days, uh, actually the, the canon law, <clears throat> which stressed natural law, had a, an almost um, equal position with regard to the king. Uh, they worked together. The king, at one stage at least, was very definitely given to understand that he he actually came under God. He was not God. He came under God just like everyone else. Uh, you mentioned Henry VIII. Well, Henry VIII decided that he was going to alter the rules, and he more or less, from what I can gather in studying history, <coughs> assumed total power for himself as the king. And this, of course, was a very, very negative development, and he actually executed one of the people who spoke out against this very strongly, and I think others. And um, so this established the strength of the state, the overstrength of the state, excessive, uh, the improper, the Im unbalanced power of the state. And um, the, um, I think the early Christian idea was that <clears throat> the individual really had a right to seek his own life without external compulsion. And um, of course, as the state has grown and as it provides more and more so-called benefits, it also acquires more and more power over the citizen. And so we're getting a situation, well, just recently we had a, what they call a G7 meeting of the economic summit here in Canada. and. Uh, our prime minister decided that he wanted to engage the support of these other nations to, uh, for a pet project of his, and that was to improve education for girls, not just in Canada, but around the world. And in the process, I think he committed something like 150 or so million dollars, and the others also committed too. Uh, well, on what authority? What, on what basis did he do that? Did he did he have even an approval from Parliament? It sounds to me like they just went ahead and did it. Well, I mean, this is irresponsible power. Thank you, Wally. That's that's really really important. Uh, that illustration of uh, Trudeau spending the money and essentially he's socially engineering, uh, as the other leaders are. They're social engineering. They've got a a deliberate purpose here, and that is the design in in what's actually going on. There's, uh, it's malevolent, and if you don't understand that word, look it up. It's certainly no good in it. Betty Luke's. Well, of course, uh, Wally mentioned uh, <clears throat> the the financial system and the and the power of the state over there in 
in Canada, well, it's no different here to us in Australia. And, um, and I'm thinking of what Jesus had to say about mammon. And it wasn't very good. And, of course, mammon was the mo uh, word for money in those days. And uh, I recently watched part of a video presented by um, the Monetary Institute in, in the UK, I think, and uh, Dr. Werner um, explained to the audience that certain banks have the power to create the monies, uh, the nation's money supply. Well, of course, that was known a hundred years ago. Douglas wrote about it and others wrote about it a hundred years ago. There is nothing new in what he said. The, the difference is that he might have um, demonstrated it uh, by, by his figures, um, but they still don't come to the question of what's the purpose of a money system? And that, to me, is much more important than, uh, well, of course, you know, for those who don't know that banks create money out of nothing, out of thin air, then they should learn about it because this is where their power has been usurped. But what is the purpose of a money system? And I'm sure that there is much within the New Testament that gives the understanding of what is the canon of rightness when it comes to a money system. Thank you for that, Betty. That's uh, that's most important. And where we're going here is we're we're actually looking at the, um, if you like, the uh, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. And if it gets to a stage where a system is such that it stops the individuals from having sufficient time to to worship, to worship, to actually spend contemplative time and consider their time and space on this earth. And, and what they're here for. These things are most profound, most important. And uh, when you get to a stage of working 50, 60 longer hours a week, there's no time for anything. And, uh, and so the, the role, if you like, of uh, finance is, is instrumental in causing this to, to come about. And if you look at the debt clock, I keep on harping on it, but the debt clock is never going backwards. It's always increasing. And that means that this system is designed to achieve that purpose, enslave the people. No different, I might add, no different than Joseph with his coat of many colours. Wally Kling. Well, you talk about the love of money being the root of all evil, not money. Money is just simply a currency. If you have certain assets or the prospect of doing something and you can get money issued to you, by a bank, in other words, credit, so that you can obtain things from the public to allow you to mobilize those productive resources, that's all money is. It's just simply a, a demand, a, an effective demand, but it is affected through accountancy. And uh, it's uh, really not mysterious, it's just uh, rational. We operate on a system of promises to pay. And money is issued on the amount of credit or belief that you have in the ability of the borrower to deliver money at the agreed time. So um, it's, and here we have, talking about the love of money, we have here, we have at this G7, you have President Trump from the United States is complaining bitterly about the trade imbalance that he has, that his nation has had over a period of years which incidentally has been contributed to their imperialistic reaching out and dominating other nations for resources because they have to uh, compete in this environment. Uh, and then you have our prime minister, of course, <coughs> complaining and threatening to retaliate on the tariffs that the Americans are now saying they're going to institute against steel and agricultural products. But you know what they're doing? If you realize what they're doing, they're all f fighting each other for a right to give more of their real wealth away than they're getting back in return because they covet the symbol rather than the reality. They're trying to capture credits to make up an artificial scarcity of money in each of their domestic economies. So they're trying to get rid of more money or more real goods than they are getting back and they're fighting over the ability to dispose of their abundance in that sense. I mean, 
it's, it's, it's absolutely insane if you think about it. Thank you, Wally. That's excellent. Excellent illustration. They are actually competing to reduce the amount of uh, resources that they hold for themselves, hand them over to someone else in order to extract a symbol. That's all money is, is a symbol. And when we talk about law, canon law, natural law, this has got nothing to do with it. Nothing to do in the sense that the money system doesn't operate under those. It operates under a false premise. And the premise is a scarcity. Of what? Of symbols. A scarcity of symbols. It's, it's a form of madness. It's a hallucinogenic madness. And if anything that is immoral in this day, it is the silence on this issue. The moral silence on this issue. Betty Lux. Well, yes, Annie. I, um, I thought about this this morning when I was reading about what Dr. Werner had to say. And uh, I got angry. I got angry at what passes for the moral authority today, which, of course, is the organized churches. And, um, and I thought, well, no wonder. No wonder that they, their pews are empty, that the people have left them in droves because they're not relevant to the, to the world of today. And uh, if, if people want to have a look in the New Testament at some of the parables of Jesus, the parable of, of the workers in the field and the steward paid the, the worker who only worked one hour as much as he paid the ones that worked eight hours. Now, why? And the amount of money that was paid was enough for the worker for the day because he has to live. And uh, as it was 2,000 years ago, so it is today. And um, I, I challenge the churches in that sense. Don't start giving me sermons about the sins I might commit because unless you have... Unless the situation is such that I can make a free choice of what I do in this world today, instead of the oppression that is all around me, then um, I see the churches as just hypocrites, the, the leaders as just hypocrites. Do, do they not read the same New Testament as I do? If they do, why have they not looked at, uh, say, Revelation 17 and 18? and read about the whore of Babylon. There you're reading about what you're seeing today. But that was what happened in the Roman, as the Roman civilization was disintegrating. And as we see our civilization dis disintegrating. Thank you, Arnie. No worries. Thank you for that, uh, Betty. And I'll remind our, our listeners also of the story in Luke, when it talks about, and it's on our, um, it's on our YouTube channel, the story of Luke. The lilies in the field and how all the nations are pursuing are attempting to pursue the material things they're all trying to achieve it and jesus says seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you what does that mean this is this is the very key to unlocking the kingdom the kingdom is the wool being taken from your eyes. The kingdom is there. It is a kingdom of abundance. It is a world of plenty. We have the robotics. We've got the machines. We have the energy. We have the resources, the natural resources. It's all there. We have a time of abundance. And yet this unnatural, unnatural form of hypnotism called finance has got us to the stage where our leaders are vying over symbols. They're fighting over symbols. It's, it's absolute madness. Wally. Yes, it certainly is, Ernie. It is um, psychotic, you might say. Uh, we have a veil that has been placed over us, a veil of finance, which gives a representation of reality, which is a shrunken and shrinking image of the reality of abundance that we have. As a matter of fact, even during the Depression, it wasn't a scarcity of goods. It was a scarcity of markets because there wasn't enough money for people to purchase. And so what happened in the midst of that abundance, they plowed their crops under, they destroyed their livestock. 
the um, plowed their, their orchards under or, or destroyed them. They, um, and even today, we have, as we've said before, 50% approximately of the American economy is devoted in one way or another to the war economy. Now, that is, a, to a large extent, a very, very large extent, just energy that is spent for the purpose of giving people work to do and paying them. Unfortunately, it is not done freely because there is a debt associated to that, which forms a mortgage on the future, which we will have to do further work in order to pay off. And we will never pay it off because when you engage in further work, it creates an even bigger shortage of purchasing power and you have to go more into debt or create more artificial activity. We're slaves. We're literally slaves. And we do not know it. I think a lot of people sense that there's something wrong, but they do not have a clear view. As I said, as I mentioned before, I, I understand that the British Association of Bankers actually allocated five, uh, I think it was five um, million British pounds sterling to combat the social credit idea. And that was similar. Uh, there was also a similar financing, not that large in Canada, by the Banking Association of Canada to uh, bring out a refutation of the social credit idea. So, um, you know, we're, we're definitely, uh, been f we've been facing some very difficult adversaries. And um, it's not just a question of an honest, open, fair debate. No worries. Thank you for that, Wally. That's... Um... That's an excellent summary, and it also provides a bit of insight in that who who stands to lose or gain the most from the current situation. Obviously, the banks do. The central banks, the Bank of International Settlements, and the banksters that go with it. They're the ones who actually gain and benefit out of this, and of course, they are impoverishing the entire world. Betty Lux. Well, Arnie, I, I think that um, we really do have to get back to what these canons are, what they really are. We were told to seek ye first the kingdom of God, and, and this is what we're doing. We're, we, we need to seek those canons to understand how, the, how we're, we're, we're going the wrong way. Um, Eric Butler mentioned it many years ago um, when he said, you know, finally people will be tired of banging their head against the wall and they will look for other answers and he spoke of the canon and uh, and i can't think what the issues were at the time but he said you don't see the effect immediately but eventually you do and if and it says in the athanasian creed before before all things not some things before all things then you think of the trinity and uh, <clears throat> whether it's, as we were talking about, uh, the money situation, well, the, the, and what is the purpose of the money? Well, isn't it to ensure the production, the distribution, and the consumption of the nation's produce for the people? And uh, that, again, is a Trinitarian balance. And this is where we're, as I see it, we are lacking. And this is the way we're going to have to go. Really look at it. If you're not going to get the, if you're not going to get those uh, teachings from your the church leader, then you're going to have to seek them out yourself. Thank you for that, Betty. That's um, that's an excellent summary, actually, of of where we are. That um, if you're not getting it, if you, if the moral law, if the canon law, is not presented from the church, and when they depicting books of law based on the Old Testament and nothing about canon law, nothing about the natural law, nothing about the moral code and the, the clear distinctions. It was um, Dorothy L. Sayers, um, uh, Creed and Chaos and the Mind of the Maker that I've recently gone through. And uh, it helped illustrate to me that there is so much more to understand, so much more to understand and there is a depth. And of course, these creeds, um, they place us in good stead as what our, if you like, what our founding faith is about, about these, these anchor documents 
that uh, that give us uh, clarity. Okay, so I'll call for um, I'll call for final comments, Wally. Well, you remember that um, <clears throat> Jesus uh, lost his temper, if you if you want, on only one occasion that I can remember, and that was when he literally drove the money changers out of the temple. The problem is we are an idolatrous people. We worship a symbol which gives a false representation of reality, and we react on the basis of that false representation, which is accountable, which accounts for most of our problems, all of the perverse situations that we have in the world. And uh, so um, my, we have to stop worshiping money as something. It's nothing. It's just, it's just a, a record of what we do in experiencing our life. And we have to, to start having due regard and gratitude for the abundance, the real abundance, the physical abundance, the, the associational abundance, and everything else that contributes to life, to real life. And we have to devise or alter our money system to uh, reflect that. And Betty, you mentioned consumption. Economics is production, distribution, and consumption. There's only one purpose for production, and that's consumption. Any rational person doesn't just go out and do all sorts of mindless things without some objective. And the objective is the result that you get from your activity, and that's consumption. Economics is not to keep people busy. It does not assume that people are fundamentally nasty, immoral creatures, and that we have to be kept in line. That is exactly what the policy of full employment implies. I did notice in reading the uh, essay on um, the early history of the church and so on that um, at that time, apparently, there was not an assumption that human beings were incorrigibly evil. Uh, that was, a, uh, was a, an idea that developed later on, and it's the underlying idea beneath our existing uh, financial system, because everyone's talking about full employment, full employment. What is the rate of full employment today? What was it last month? Oh, it's so much better now. It's down. We, more of us are working. <laughs> I have suggested maybe abolishing the full employment statistics. Maybe we should either replace it or at least augment it, accompany it by a leisure statistics, which might be a more appropriate indication of how successful we are in our actual economic relationships. In other words, how efficient we are at producing what we need and want. Uh, that's a rational statistic. Full employment is just a representation of slavery. That's what it is. Because it represents unnecessary, increasingly unnecessary work to earn income so that we can go back and purchase what we've already produced. Excellent summary. Thank you for that, Wally. Um, yes, Betty Luke's closing comments. Well, it is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his rightness and all these things will be added unto you. Beautiful. Thank you. This is Arnie Lukes. I think it's an excellent, um, an excellent forum we've had today, and, and I uh, just welcome you, uh, viewers, to visit our YouTube channel. Look at the other work that we've done. Look at our Crossroads website, um, which is where all these uh, videos go up, and uh, and stay in touch. This is Arnie Lukes. Once was a swagman camped by a billabong under the shade of a coolabar tree. As he sat, as he watched, and waited while his billy boiled. So come a waltzing Matilda with me.